Hello to everybody here um, and hello to everybody over there. Um, it's great to be back with you all talking about opera, talking about um, femme fatales of opera. So this week we're going to be discussing uh, Wagner's Parsifal. Now Parsifal, of course, is not uh, the uh, femme fatale in this opera. He is the main character. The one we'll be talking about is Kundry. Um, but we're going to be talking about Wagner, um, his, his importance, his significance, and then we're going to get uh, into the creation of the opera, the origins of the opera, and then eventually down into uh, the rabbit hole that is explaining Kundry. Uh, so um, we're going to talk about a couple things that we've already addressed over the last several months. Um, so if you've already seen this, just consider it review. <laughs> so um, First of all, uh, a, a bit of a, a, a historical backdrop for the conception of this opera uh, and uh, European opera in general uh, during this time. So uh, we've talked in the past about uh, in the around 1850 to 1900, the um, 1848 European revolutions in France and in Germany. Um, there's a large growing middle class throughout the section, which is again related to these revolutions sort of class consciousness, you're thinking of Marx, so on and so forth, um, um, and uh, a move towards public education, sort of the, the, um, the general um, educating and enriching um, and uh, the inclusion of culture for the middle class. And so um, opera is a great example of uh, this as music as entertainment. So essentially, um, Forms uh, like light opera, I'm thinking Gilbert and Sullivan, um, Johann Strauss, um, often Jacques Offenbach, these types of sort of middle brow um, and low brow musics are becoming more and more popular. And uh, this is part of this growing, uh, growing middle class. Um, and on top of that, again, related to the Political unrest is the Industrial Revolution, sort of the complete overhauling of the way that um, European society was working. Um, in particular, uh, for an, an, a relevance to Wagner because of his nationalist tendencies, um, uh, we see a rise of both nationalism and conservatism, not just in Germany, but throughout, uh, throughout Europe. So for instance, um, what this means for musicians, as, as we've, we've talked about before, is that this means that um, the three main pillars of, of musical culture, so that's Italy, France, and Germany, um, Eve are sort of remaining stalwart in uh, the kind of uh, product that they present. They want, to, they want something that's authentically theirs, but not only the, those countries are doing this, not only really the biggest exp, uh, exponents of their music, but also, you know, the, we're thinking of um, Eastern European countries, um, Russia, um, so on and so forth, uh, London, uh, England, um, the, all of these countries are trying to create something that's more authentically theirs and not um, sort of uh, influenced or uh, I guess one could go so far as to say harmed by outside Western influence um, of especially German music. Um, and this is related to the standardization of languages, this is really, uh, related to the consolidation of diverse ethnic groups. Um, but uh, more than anything for Wagner, um, uh, and really um, a lot of these composers, it's, it's an assertion of cultural dominance um, and this is especially important, as I said, for Wagner and the idea of what um, German opera is and what German art is. So um, take that into account when, when, we're, when we're thinking of, of Wagner. But um, going further into what Wagner was interested in, what was sort of the general interest is this idea of this mythology, exoticism, nationalism. Um, obviously, Wagner's ring cycle is really uh, is, is, is a... Scandinavian Nordic um, upper European uh, tale, the Rheingold saga. Um, and uh, this, uh, this is part of um, what Wagner is, which is a lot of what's going on. Um, but let's also talk about uh, the, the three national styles that, we've, that I've mentioned and I've, and I've talked about before. So there's, of course, Italian, French, and German. Um, for Italy, we have the bel canto style. So this is sort of an offshoot of Mozart's um, Italian operas. 
um, that is best represented by um, Verdi, Rossini, Donizetti, um, bel canto just meaning uh, well sung. And it's a particularly uh, sort of, uh, it's a style that is uh, stuck in sort of a rut at the time that Wagner is trying to write these more sort of mellifluous, uh, lush romantic style. These uh, Italian operas are typically what we call number operas. So divided by aria, recitative, duet, recitative, aria, so on and so forth. Very sort of formal, formulaic um, style of writing. Um, and it's also known uh, in particular for its very virtuosic and very uh, colorful singing style that uh, is best exemplified by a work such as uh, Rigoletto uh, by Verdi. So this is Caronomi from Rigoletto, uh, which uh, is one of Verdi's best known and most beloved operas. Uh, and this is, uh, a, a, I can't remember who the singer is for this one, but it's a production from the Met. Again, this is this is this is typical of this type of style. Really, sort of highly ornamented. Again, very virtuosic uh, coloratura in the soprano. Um, this type of Italian opera is is concerned with um, telling stories um, that are more relatable than, for example, uh, the French counterpart, part, um, grand opera. So, um, one of the biggest proponents of this was Giacomo Meyerbeer, who was actually a, a first at first a strong advocate of Wagner's. Um, this 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 relationship later soured because Meyerbeer was Jewish and because Wagner was a virulent uh, anti-Semite uh, as he went along in his career. Um, but this grand opera uh, is known uh, for being uh, grand in the sense of how much uh, material uh, the floor the floridity of uh, and the, the sort of spectacle of what one expected when they saw an opera like this. So it was in five acts, um, grandiose design, huge uh, sort of uh, structures that they build um, and uh, you know uh, complicated set designs that would be necessary for the productions of these opera. Uh, ballet was an essential part of, uh, of French grand opera. This is a holdover from the Baroque era. And uh, whenever, say, Verdi had an opera that was done in France, or Wagner had an opera that was done in France, he, they had to often actually write ballet music that would then be inserted into uh, the opera if it didn't exist uh, prior to prior to be the French premiere. Um, and again, because it's grand opera, uh, it's always using historical subjects. So, for instance, uh, in uh, Les Huguenots by Meyerbeer, uh, this Act Five finale scene. Uh, is the depiction of uh, these two these two sort of star-crossed lovers who are about to be murdered for their uh, for their religious convictions.
So this, uh, the, third, the third option, of course, uh, as I mentioned, is the German. So uh, this uh, particular style of um, opera it was, it was not actually technically opera. It's called Zingspiel. Um, again, comes from Mozart. So Mozart's two uh, most famous Zingspiel are um, the adoption from the Seraglio and um, the Magic Flute, each of which uh, is sort of, um, again, it's, it's a kind of middle lowbrow entertainment. Um, usually it's a light comic opera um, that involves magic, of course, magic flute, you know, these sort of fantastical designs. Um, and this uh, developed um, in the early 19th century with Karl Maria von Weber, whose opera De Freischutz, The Free Shooter, um, is a uh, particularly, was one of the, was the best known and most successful example of uh, not, not Zingspiel, but early German opera. Uh, the thing that really did sort of uh, is a good way of distinguishing between Zingspiel and opera, first of all, is that there are no recitatives. Um, instead, all, um, all action that occurs in between numbers is actually uh, spoken. So there's no, there's no underlaying piano, no underlaying uh, uh, forte piano or a harpsichord or orchestral accompaniment. It's all actually spoken. Um, and uh, the other thing is, uh, is that uh, these, uh, generally these tunes that would be written in, and, uh, in these types of operas were much more um, uh, sort of layman tunes, things that people would go out humming, things that would be catchy, things that had folk influence. So there's, uh, this is a great example of this is the Jäger Chor, the Hunter's Chorus from De Freischutz. Um, and with the magic scene, by the way, which is a note which is too long for me to show here, is this scene in which they're casting the bullet uh, that uh, this, this free shooter is able to shoot uh, a target without have, without ever missing. And so they, there's this scene where they cast this magic bullet in the wolf's glen. Um, it's a pretty incredible scene, but it's a, it's a 10 minute long ordeal. So we're gonna stick with the, the Hunter's Chorus, which is about as German as it gets, as far as I know. <laughs> Early, um, these early German operas were particularly influential on Wagner and all German opera that came after it. Um, and actually, not just then, but uh, Bayer Beer. Um, uh, this kind of uh, style was uh, really was was, I guess, uh, kind of the zeitgeist of what was going on in, in, during this during this particularly creative uh, period. So, um, let's talk a little bit about Wagner. Oops. Not you. Very heard from you. There we go. <laughs> so, Wagner. So, um, Wagner was born born in uh, Leipzig in Prussia, um, and uh, Wagner, of course, during Wagner's lifetime, Germany would become re uh, united as a single country, and this was. Uh, 
part of um, the the celebration that the ring provides, right? Is the is the unification, the celebration of German culture, the celebration of German unity. Um, and he was raised in a theatrically interested family, and a lot of his early music, funnily enough, influences Beethoven, Mozart, Mendelssohn, Weber. Um, and um, as I mentioned before, he was guided by Giacomo Meyerbeer. Uh, a lot of his earlier operatic endeavors were unsuccessful, um, but uh, with works like, uh, you know, the Flingende Hollander, the Flying Dutchman, uh, Tannhäuser, um, and uh, especially Lohengrin, which we'll actually address very specifically, um, he began to uh, receive acclaim. But eventually, after the um, 19, 1849 Dresden Uprising, he was sent into pol uh, political exile. And his uh, longtime uh, supporter, King Ludwig II of, um, of uh, Bavaria, was um, sort of key in making a lot of his musical and uh, artistic uh, endeavors actually happen, um, more or less after 49. He, he built a castle in honor of his opera Lohengrin. Um, and this is, this is uh, the, who I should explain, Lohengrin is the knight of the swans, so the, the castle is essentially called the Swan's Castle. Um, uh, so his biggest, uh, successes prior to Parsifal. Um, as I've mentioned, the ring, um, there's Nibelungen, the ring of the Nibelung, uh, uh, Tristan und Isolde, Meisterzinger of Nuremberg. Um, and he was very close friends with a lot of the most successful artists of the day, um, and obviously philosophers Nietzsche, Liszt, Schumann. Um, and he was also known for a kind of florid uh, lifestyle of chronic marital and financial instability. Uh, so, um, Wagner, to, it's, it's, it's pretty difficult, and I've said this, I think, a couple, again, a couple times now, it's pretty difficult to underestimate Wagner's influence on arts, politics, music throughout uh, the, the 19th century and well into uh, the 20th century. I mean, uh, in, from, from Brahms to the, the sort of debate between him and, and, and Wagner on what music was supposed to be, um, to Mahler and Strauss, to um, the, the use, the sort of um, uh, use of Wagner as the composer of the Third Reich, um, as a, a sort of a cultural symbol. Um, these all um, are, are born here um, in, in, in the music of, of Wagner. So uh, his, in turn, his biggest influence was uh, Schopenhauer. Um, the idea that art um, is the reality of human experience. In particular, we're gonna talk about um, a couple of um, things that uh, are relevant in Parsifal. The first is uh, Mitleid und Selbstsucht. Uh, so that is to say, compassion and selfishness. Um, and these are the two sort of, um, the polar ends of, of the opera of Parsifal, because Schopenhauer believed that compassion was the highest form of human emotion. Um, and that uh, Schadenfreude, the pleasure, taking pleasure, of course, in others' pain, was the worst of the human emotions. And this, these are the two, these uh, polar ends of, of uh, the, this human uh, emotional spectrum are components of Parsifal that are, that are integral. Um, one thing that I should also mention is, is uh, that is particularly noteworthy for uh, Parsifal is his idea of uh, the renunciation or the abnegation of the will, which is to say being able to sort of free yourself from earthly tethers. This is all influenced of, uh, by um, Eastern philosophy. And um, as it will become relevant in, in Parsifal on the Knights of the Grail, uh, chastity is the highest form for Schopenhauer of that abnegation. Um, Jan Wagner, in turn, actually kind of um, uh, sort of usurps this in uh, Parsifal, and because he was he was sort of he kind of scoffed at this idea that that was uh, that that was uh, necessary for for the abnegation of the will. As I mentioned, mythology, nationalism, it's all part of his musical lexicon. Uh, Buddhism and Eastern philosophy, he actually um, wrote, uh, was going to write a, an opera called Desiga, the, uh, the, the champions, the winners, um, in uh, his 
mid-career that was based on a Buddhist uh, story, uh, but never completed it. But again, this material gets recycled in Parsifal. Um, you know, Wagner um, really propagated this idea of art as religion. He built famously an opera house that still stands today that where they perform all of Wagner's operas, the Bayreuth Festspielhaus um, in 1876, which was funded by Ludwig uh, II. Um, and this is where all of his works um, are, were, were, were actually played. And many of them were only allowed to, some of them were only allowed to be uh, performed in this hall for a time. For instance, Parsifal. Um, they had exclusive rights over it for, um, I think, about 30, 50 odd years. Um, and people saw this trip to Bayreuth as a pilgrimage. So composers like Debussy, um, uh, Chanson, a lot of these French composers who would, who would uh, come over and uh, visit Bayreuth to see a pr production, Tchaikovsky. Um, this was viewed as, as a religious rite. Um, uh, Wagner is also known for this idea of Gesamtkunstwerk, so the complete work of art. So um, he saw um, in, in his writings from uh, 1850, uh, the artwork of the future, um, music is a universal and unifying art form. So um, all others that uh, fall under the umbrella of art, so visual, dance, um, theater, um, uh, the spoken word, the written word, these all can be uh, viewed as one in this, uh, as, as sort of um, artwork should be created that uh, combines all of these elements, that sort of unifies and explains one uh, particular uh, story, for instance, which is sort of exemplified in all of his operas. This is why Wagner wrote all of his librettos. He actually published his librettos as separate uh, works, as separate literary works um, during his lifetime. Um, because he viewed that this is a separate type of poetry. It's interesting because they don't, it's, they don't, it's, it's kind of contradictory because if you're writing text that is supposed to be set to music, uh, that is supposed to work only as music as the unifying whole, it doesn't necessarily stand um, by itself. But uh, he had a bit of an ego. <laughs> um, so uh, a couple other um, important things to mention, of course, religion und Kunst, religion and art, in 1880, uh, this was a, uh, a sort of a, an essay that he wrote about uh, as he was completing and finishing Parsifal about the relationship between the two. Um, and uh, of course, there's his, his anti-Semitic diatribe, Jewishness and Music, where he um, sort of saw Jewish influence as a, a, a universally negative and um, uh, detrimental force to culture as being sort of um, anti-German, anti-progression, um, anti uh, and, and about sort of, I mean, it, it's sort of playing into the worst stereotypes that music is uh, written by Jewish composers is solely made to make money. Uh, so this would, uh, composers such as Mendelssohn, Meyerbeer, um, these composers would fall under this category of, so, of the so-called denigrated music. Um, and as I mentioned before, this is certainly an idea that uh, the Nazis took a hold of in uh, the Third Reich. So I um, think that that more or less covers everything that you need to know, right? Um, but um, the story here of Parsifal um, is, um, it's of course, um, it's, it's a, it's a uh, Parsifal is a, a Germanicization of Percival, who is one of the knights of the Holy Grail. So uh, this um, story, uh, of course, would have been retold um, in various different um, poetries uh, uh, through uh, oral tradition, so on and so forth. But um, the one that Wagner was familiar with was Wolfram von Eschenbach, who was a 13th century uh, poet um, of the medieval Germany. He was sort of known as uh, the best uh, and uh, the most the most um, the most successful the most the best quality poetry the best artist of this um, of this 13th century period so Parsifal is um, a, a chivalric romance um, that tells of the nightly life of Parsifal who's this impulsive and innocent um, 
uh, a character who is uh, known as a pure fool um, because there's this sort of association uh, with uh, ancient Persian, which is, is believed to be um, uh, erroneous, but Parsi, uh, uh, Parsi and Fal, so Fal meaning fool and Parsi meaning pure. Um, and this sort of combination of, of these two things, uh, Wagner and, and uh, believed to be uh, the origins of this name. Um, and it's about his story to the ascent to being the Lord of the Grail. Um, and and we'll, we'll get into the plot specifically of the opera because it, it does, of course, differ from um, uh, uh, Wagner's original text, um, the, well, rather Eschenbach's original text, Wolfram's original text. Uh, but these are, this is an incredibly long poem. It's something like 25,000 stanzas long. It's in this discursive style. And um, what's interesting to note is that the Grail, um, which is the the... Uh, the vessel that caught Christ's blood um, as he was bleeding on the cross um, is not actually uh, is especially Christian um, in significance for these early uh, tellings of the story. You know, the, the, in Wolfram's, it's actually a stone, like a stone basin. Um, and other, in other tellings, it's, it's, other, it's, it's still more obscured from uh, Christianity. It's more pagan, if anything. Um, Celtic in, in, in origin. Um, interesting to note, Wolfram von Eschenbach was considered a uh, minnesinger, which is related to Meistersingers, and um, Wagner's opera Tannhäuser is about the minnesingers, of course, obviously the Meistersinger von Nuremberg is about the Meistersingers. But um, this first reading in 1845 um, of the Wolfram led to the creation and the sort of ferment fermentation of uh, all these uh, three of his biggest operas, so Lohengrin, uh, which is the first to be completed, uh, Meistersinger, the second, and then finally Parsifal. Um, so looking at the way that uh, this developed, so, you know, the, he first had the idea for, for Parsifal in the 1850s, but there were several uh, works, um, three of them, Lohengrin, De Zieger, and Jesus von Nazareth, um, which would uh, be uh, sort of consequential in terms of how he developed the opera, because his biggest problem was how to connect Parsifal, uh, the, the, the pure fool, with um, Amfortas, who is the king of the, uh, of the, of the Knights of the Grail, the Lord of the Knights of the Grail, and he has been wounded with his own blade, the um, the lance which pierced the side in in Wagner's retelling, which pierced the side of Christ, and and he's in, inflicted with this wound that will not heal. And uh, the the question for Wagner is how does how does Parsifal gain the compassion, the Schopenhauerian compassion, um, and the knowledge and the insight into this. Uh, older uh, mentor, essentially, um, that he uh, can sort of gain that, uh, that ultimate human emotion. How does that transference happen? And the answer for him was, uh, was, was sort of, it came to him in somewhat of an epiphany or, or of sorts, or, you know, so, so he tells, you know, the, the, they're never exactly, uh, they always like to uh, dramatize what actually happens. They always like to play up the story a little bit, but this character was Kundri, was this sort of the connection point between Parsifal and um, Anfortas. And Kundri is a, um, an amalgamation of a couple different characters. So um, from these three, uh, these three different operas. So we'll first talk about Lohengrin. So Lohengrin was yet another Knight of the Grail. Um, and he, this, this uh, opera, um, is a separate story to to Parsifal, but um, in fact, I believe Lohen. I, I could be I could be wrong, but I'm but I'm pretty sure that Lohengrin is the son of Parsifal. So um, I'm going to play a few, just an excerpt in Funim Land, uh, which is the description of um, the Temple of the Grail uh, in um, um, in Lohengrin's homeland, and I'll. Compare it with the opening music from the prelude, rather, from Parsifal, when you hear the sort of similar sonic worlds that they're inhabiting. <clears throat> Deine Blut. 
So compare this with, say, the tribute from Parsifal. If I can get this. Of course, the texture is a lot more sort of um, ephemeral, uh, sort of glistening, but it's a similar type of um, sort of the idea of the grail being um, uh, uh, descending from heaven into the temple. So, so that's the first of these uh, these. Uh, in, of uh, early creations of Wagner's that sort of went on to influence Parsifal. Um, most obvious, of course, same story. Um, Der Sieger, the, the, the winners, uh, is an incomplete sketch that was, um, that was uh, an opera that he had I, this idea for, um, uh, influenced by, uh, in Eastern philosophy, the ideas of reincarnation. Um, Prakriti and Anada, these two um, lovers who um, the Buddha actually recommends to Prakriti that she not marry him because in the past life, she had mocked him, uh, had his, his past life and therefore they should not get married. Um, and this um, is again, uh, uh, relevant uh, later for, uh, for Kundri because uh, she uh, is uh, cursed to walk the earth forever forever for laughing um, at Christ on the cross. Um, and so she's sort of seen as having these various re reincarnations as, um, as Herodias, the, the queen of Judea, um, of uh, various, uh, she, she's called by Quince or these various names, these rows of death. Um, uh, these, I uh, can't, can't, can't remember, they're off the top of my head right now. There's a Nordic uh, uh, god she's, she's referred to who wanders the earth. Um, she's almost thought of as a wandering Jew character um, who ultimately is absolved in the end and, and uh, atones for her sins. Um, but uh, the final, the final opera, of course, is uh, Jesus of Nazareth. Um, that again was never completed. Um, and uh, when we when we read sketches of the sort of the characters, the ideas that he had. Um, Mary Magdalene's uh, character comes to mind again in terms of Kundry, in, for, in terms of uh, her final character when she goes through her final transformation of being um, uh, 
um, absolved of her of, of her sins. Um, and as I mentioned before, this Kundry's character is kind of the necessary thing that Wagner figured out in around uh, the, in the 1850s, 1860s. Uh, he would write. He wrote letters to Cosima to to um, his uh, to be eventually to be wife about uh, the uh, this her being sort of the missing thing that um, was missing from the plot. But it took him several decades more to actually flesh out the actual opera. Um, okay. So uh, the work itself is is unusual for. Uh, and a, and a great number of reasons, mainly that um, it is a hybrid work, as many of his, um, of many of his, his his operas were. There, there, as I said, this idea of this Gesamtkunstwerk, the complete work of art, lends itself to these sort of um, hybrid genres. And this work kind of combines both the sacred and the secular. It's too, um, it's too dramatic to be um, an oratorio, sort of like a a work that um, is, has uh, would be used in liturgy, and of course it's um, it's not designed that way. But it is, however, he, he refers to this piece. He does not call it an opera. He calls it a Buchnen bei Festspiel, a uh, festival play for the consecration of the stage. Uh, it's kind of a very uh, it's a very Wagnerian term. There's no other way of putting it. Um, but it is uh, it is. It was a work that was only allowed, as I said before, to be performed at Bayreuth um, until it was premiered in, in Met, I think, in, at the Metropolitan Opera, I think, in 1912. But um, as I mentioned, Wagner wrote the libretto himself. He wrote all of his own librettos, um, and, and uh, the poetry was incredibly important to him. Um, and uh, is, it just lends itself to a much more philosophical uh, sort of conception of the piece. So. Uh, the plot, in short, is that um, the, the Knights of the Grail, led by Anfortas, um, uh, are keeping hold of the Grail. He has, he has had his lance stolen um, by an unknown assailant, um, an unknown female assailant. And um, as Gurnamanso, this elder Knight of the Grail, um, is with acolytes, they're sort of um, talking about, he's uh, explaining the action, all of a sudden, um, a swan, a dead, a swan that has been shot, is carried into the uh, into the into the circle of, of knights, and uh, Parsifal wanders in. They ask him what his name is, who his father is, where he's from. He, he answers to all these questions. I do not know. Um, they then they chastise him for for hunting this swan, and he and he sort of realizes his 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 sin, and he and he and he feels pain for his actions. Um, Amfortas comes in. He's, he, you know, he he sings of his uh, his plight, his pain, and his guilt. Um, the idea of the, the this wound that cannot be healed is um, is twofold. It's it's first of all, it's a metaphor for syphilis because what has happened is that he has been seduced by Kundry, um, who, meanwhile, uh, none of none of the characters, of course, know this, but Kundry is on the sidelines, guiltily helping. Uh, the the Knights of the Grail, sort of as a, as, as a secondary servant of the Grail, because she, as we then move on to Act Two, after uh, Parsifal was banished from the land of the Grail, that um, you know the, the whole the whole time they're singing of the pure fool who's supposed to wander in, um, and they don't some for some reason they don't recognize that it's him because he's the Dingus, who's walk, who's running around shooting swans, um, and they they expel him out of the lands, and so he walks into the magician Klingsor's palace. And Klingsor was a knight of the of the uh, of of the Grail, but he could not uh, keep his head from impure thoughts, so he self castrated, as one naturally does when they can't keep <laughs> impure thoughts out of their head, um, and. Um, he was more or less. Uh, he was for this for this act, not because he self castrated, but because he could not keep impure thoughts out of his head. He was expelled from the Knights of the Grail, and so in revenge, he he's been seeking to undo the Knights of the Grail the whole time. So he he enslaved he has enslaved Kundry, who, as I've mentioned, is this uh, millennia old character, or actually at that point probably centuries, maybe not millennia. Uh, who uh, just wants, basically, just wants to die because she is living through living hell her her for centuries, and uh, her 
penitence. She wants. She just wants to be absolved for her sins. Um, and ultimately, Parsifal um, uh, is at first almost seduced by Kundri, who then uh, it then realizes in uh, um, in the moment that they kiss, the pain that Amfortas is feeling, the the um, the the sort of the compassion element of this uh, Schopenhauerian um, uh, uh, philosophy, and uh, Kundri uh, curses him to not be able to ever return to the uh, to the uh, to the glade of the of the Knights of the Grail, and in turn he reclaims the 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 um, the lance. And destroys Klingsor's palace and all his this beautiful garden that he has, and all these um, women that are there who are there specifically to seduce various knights who come, you know, too close. <laughs> um, and the final act takes years later, un unspecified number of years later. Everybody's much older, and uh, Parsifal returns, a much older man, to uh, the, the 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 realm of the Knights of the Grail. And Amfortas, who is who is refused to uh, reveal the Grail to, to the knights ever since uh, Act One, his father has passed away because of the life because he no longer has the life giving properties of the Grail, and all the, the he begs for them he begs for his fellow knights to kill him, but then Parsifal comes along, given sort of the, the is now recognized on his return as being the pure fool who they were looking for and is named King of the Grail. He absolves Kundri and she falls dead, end of opera. Um, but uh, as I mentioned, all these are the, these are the five main characters. There are also, of course, you know, minor, minor roles, but these are the main, main people. Uh, typical of um, uh, Wagner opera, huge orchestra, triple winds, large brass, large you know, bajillion harps, you know, strings. Um, and he's known for this technique called endless melody. This is the idea of um, instead of these number operas like we see in French and Italian works, um, and actually in Weber too, um, it's a sort of a sinuous, uh, constant drama that um, recitative and aria are no longer distinguished. The 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 uh, orchestra is sort of a part of the whole. Drama, the the texture, the 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 vocal line, everything is sort of all blended together. Um, and one thing to mention about um, this opera, as it is Wagner's last, is uh, his relationship with um, tonality. We've talked about common practice. We've talked about um, uh, all of the sort of developments in the 20th century, but Wagner is one of the places where it is most influential. So, in an opera like. Um, uh, such as Tristan and Isolde, where chromaticism, this sort of never uh, resolving chords. Uh, this is one that we've talked about at length, and the sort of the implications of this never, uh, these, these never resolving chords. But on the other hand, you have like an opera like um, Meistersinger. <laughs> This is the antithesis of, of uh, Tristan, right? It's, it's super clear tonality. And uh, this opera actually sort of likes to play between these two things, the tonality being sort of representative, these, the clear um, uh, various uh, sort of melodies associated with Parsifal, or the simple ones, the ones that are associated with naivety, uh, with uh, this brashness, this character. Whereas the chromatic ones are the ones that are used to associate us with pain, with suffering, with deception. So, uh, as I mentioned before, the, this idea of the endless melody, this is the idea of an internal dialogue that is happening with the characters being displayed through what is happening in the music. That the words don't necessarily have to be the only way that 
uh, this is communicated. The inner psychology is sort of um, the dramatic irony, perhaps, let's say, of having um, the singer say, um, I'm just coming up with something off the top of my head. This is not actually what happens, but saying, I'm feeling very calm, but the music going ballistic. This is sort of this contradiction um, can be something that happens in Wagner. There's, uh, these types of uh, uh, internal versus external dialogue. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the use of dramatic irony is especially important in Parsifal. Parsifal is considered the one of the first um, symbolist operas, um, which is to say that, for instance, the dead swan, um, which is often brought in, you know, covered in blood, um, is a symbol for um, Fortas. Um, or say again, you know, on Fortas's wound being a symbol for syphilis. Um, these very sort of many layered uh, ideas, um, each, each one sort of representing another thing. Um, but in the case of uh, the dramatic irony, it's interesting, you go watch the whole opera and then you watch it again, you realize uh, that there are certain things that are, that are going on that you didn't notice the first time. For instance, uh, when Kundry enters, uh, the acolytes of the, of, the, of the Knights of the Grail do not trust her. Uh, but they don't trust her because she's a woman, not because she's done any, they know that she's done anything wrong. Whereas uh, Gunnemann's uh, incorrectly trusts her, but knows that, but, but is basing it off of her actions rather than what, what she's seeing, that bringing him, uh, bringing uh, Amfortas balsam to help salve his wounds, his wound rather. Um, and the, uh, the, the, the whole plot is sort of littered with these double meanings that happen and all these sort of uh, two sides of one coin. Um, so uh, the biggest thing that uh, we've talked about before, so I'm not going to get into it too much, um, is leitmotivic structure. And just to remind you, this is the idea that um, Wagner created to uh, write sort of a, a musical story or sort of like a way of narrating ideas, having ideas, uh, associated musical phrases uh, combine um, to create a musical story that supports what's going on on stage. So um, for instance, uh, this uh, in Parsifal, this theme that we listened to before is sometimes called the love fest theme, feast, rather, love feast theme, um, uh, this. <laughs> So this particular theme um, is associated with, of course, the grail, but it transforms as it goes throughout the opera. Um, and this is the idea of how, how a leitmotivic piece can work, that, the, that these ideas sort of transform and go along. Um, but the characters in the opera each are part of the parable that is told in Parsifal. So of course, we have Parsifal, the naive um, and constant um, character who goes from, un, from compassion to understanding, from understanding others' pain to, to sort of becoming uh, a full human, as it were, as like a, a, a sort of fully realized human. And on the other side of that, um, he, we have Amfortas, who whose guilt and suffering belies his knowledge of the world, but he does, he, he of course is the character that Parsifal must, you know, sort of, uh, as we said before, sort of, there has to be that connection. One is old, one is young. Uh, they sort of are, are, are on opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, we of course have Klingsor, the evil and corrupting sorcerer, uh, and Kundri, who we're now we're gonna actually have a chance to focus on. Um, her, uh, her redemption through the grail, through the, through Parsifal is key to the whole story. Um, and as a result, as I've said before, it's clear between, you know, her, her many transgressions and her constant attempt at being good. She actually says, it's very interesting. She says, uh, these sort of bizarre little, uh, truthisms at the very beginning, she's always saying, 
I never do good. I'm not good. Um, and she, it's not that she's saying that she's necessarily bad. She's just saying that she just sort of exists on, in this constant state of having being sort of this, um, uh, this curse laid on her. Um, and uh, she uh, is sort of a, in this parable, if, we, if we're going to consider this uh, such, she could be considered Eve, uh, Amfortas Adam, and that she is the person who is sort of the first communication of, um, of original sin, right? Whereas Parsifal would be sort of represented by Jesus, such that when uh, when she when uh, Kundri tries to seduce Parsifal, it is it's not it's not just it's not just not successful. It's sort of the passageway for atonement. That in fact, when Kundri does kiss Parsifal, it becomes the uh, it is the moment where he actually realizes. The pain of Amfortas. It's sort of the. It's it's almost like there's a sort of a transcendental understanding, which happens here in Act Two. In Parsifal, listen to a little bit of this. It's also interesting because as this information, of course, this sort of understanding, this compassion that is transferred from Kundri through Anfortas to Parsifal, um, there's also um, a couple other things at play here because, of course, uh, she's also this, the the she is she becomes at first while when she tries to seduce him. She's doing it because she's being ordered to. But at the end, after this sort of mutual understanding, she realizes that she actually does love Parsifal and that she tries to then say, no, you, 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 must, you must be with me. This is the only way for us to achieve enlightenment. But it is in fact 
the his sort of rejection after this that allows this to happen because uh, the way that she sort of presents it is actually she she sort of seduces him in this kind of bizarre Oedipal way where she's sort of convincing him that it was his fault that his mother died. He, he abandons his mother who then dies of grief um, and says that she will in turn sort of play, the, will, can be, will be there for him, will be now be his mother. Um, and this sort of, uh, uh, this, in the case of Kundri, this poor Madonna complex and, and toss in the mother <laughs> at the same time um, is uh, something that was of particular interest to a lot of the, art, the artists back then, as it has been for a very long time, um, the two Marys, as, as you were. Um, but um, especially, of course, interesting in the 19th century when uh, women were, were beginning to have more rights um, there was a fear and a fascination of, of women. And uh, Wagner's Kundry is a representation that, uh, is, that uh, is more, is uh, certainly much kinder than, uh, than a lot of the other more misogynistic representations, where it is that essentially women are part of human spiritual development. Um, it's interesting, at the very beginning, she actually starts um, as this deformed uh, animal-like creature. Um, she's referred to as sphinx-like. Um, uh, uh, Wagner referred to as having a dog-like devotion to the grail. Um, and uh, her uh, transformation in sec the second act to this sort of uh, beautiful uh, succubus that, uh, is that, tri that is seducing all these various uh, knights um, is, uh, is the second transformation, of course, by the very end, she's actually uncovered in the bushes as she was at the very beginning. But now this time she is being reborn. She's in this, the, in, the, in the garb of an acolyte um, and she can't speak. She's, she, she can only say the words um, to serve, to serve, um, presumably meaning to the grail, presumably meaning to God. Um, there's also, uh, through, through the understanding of the relationship between um, uh, Klingsor and the knights to women, um, that uh, essentially their two uh, extremes, one of them is, you know, um, as um, self-denial uh, through, through uh, self-castration, the other one is self-denial through basically substituting the grail in for uh, for women um, is that this is this hatred um, is a sin. This this uh, the 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 relying on the grail is also uh, simply just basically regressing back to uh, the same way. As, um, let me let me try to rephrase this: regression um, from um, self abnegation, uh, regression from. Uh, ab abandoning your your uh, the sexuality through castration, they're basically the same thing. That um, uh, the knights and Klingsor both have it wrong. That uh, women, in the case of Kundry and in the case of uh, Wagner's opera, uh, are necessary for this sort of spiritual uh, uh, actualization. Um, so the um, redemption. And the purging of the of uh, the Schadenfreude that Kundry feels, the um, compassion that she feels, she actually tries to explain her pain that she feels as if when she sees Parsifal, she's looking upon the face of Christ. Um, uh, that this is ultimately what redeems her in the end. Um, and it's interesting how these 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 three things: the idea of pain, the idea of love, and the idea of knowledge are sort of all conflated as one um, in Wagner's final opera when uh, in, uh, in, for instance, something like Tristan and Tisolda, transformation um, uh, is seen through the lens of erotic love. Whereas here, uh, of course, Kundry has no control over her, her, uh, her actions to a certain extent, um, but she, is able to, through 
the interaction with Parsifal sort of escape uh, what she what her fate is. Um, it's it's to say that this is a uh, <laughs> a complicated uh, and multi layered work is a se severe understatement. Um, I there's there's all sorts of fascinating uh, angles that one can sort of look at this through the religious lens. I believe that Wagner was for most of his life an atheist. He may have come back to religion at the end of his life. Then most of this interest for him was more uh, sort of philosophical in nature. Um, and uh, being able to sort of unpack all of these characters, I wish we I wish uh, we could do a whole course on Parsifal just because there's so much going on here. Um, but I definitely encourage you all when you get a chance to sit through all four and a half hours of it. <laughs> um, this production um, that I've been showing through the Met is particularly excellent. It's sort of told in this fascinating um, uh, uh, sort of, uh, what's the word, post-apocalyptic environment. Um, as you saw, this um, excellent contribution to this symbolism. Obviously, there the entire second act takes place in this pool of blood, um, uh, which once you get to this part where you're realizing that he is feeling the pain, it becomes much more salient. It's fascinating. Um, Klingzor is, is, is rather gruesomely depicted with uh, a, a, basically a bleeding scalp the entire time. Um, but uh, this, um, yeah, thank you so much for all of you for coming tonight. And um, for all of you who are joining us virtually, it's uh, been definitely, uh, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to be back here and doing this again. I'll see you next month for, what am I doing next month? What am I doing next month? I can't remember. I'll tell you soon. Oh, Addis, Tom, Tom Addis, Powder Her Face, which is, uh, uh, Tom, Thomas Addis is a contemporary British composer, uh, still alive. He is one of the, he's definitely one of the most uh, frequently commissioned uh, composers and performed composers of, of the day. Fantastic opera composer. Um, and this is definitely a good addition to that. His opera will be an excellent addition to uh, the Femme Fatale series. So thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you, NCMC, for hosting us here and online. And um, yeah, it's been a pleasure. Uh, we have a question. Do, do, do. Oh, yeah, that's right. Do we have any questions? It's a great question. Oh, well, that's not a question. <laughs> um, but um, uh, thank you. Uh, are, there, are there any questions? That do, you, do you guys have anything? I, I actually have an audience to speak with who, who might have some questions. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, this relates to the role of the father. I'm sorry, I can't remember his name right now. In the first of all, you didn't mention him much, as much as the other characters, as you know, a significant part of the story, and yet you included him in the five, you know, five roles. Oh, Gurnemans? Yes, exactly. Oh, uh, so he's How does he relate to the broader story. Okay, so the question is about Gurnemans and how does he relate to the other characters in the story? He kind of is. He's a facilitator. He actually kind of narrates, he, he kind of sets the scene in act one uh, by explaining uh, this, what's happened to, to uh, Klingzor's what's happened with Amfortas. Um, he, he's kind of mm, the narrator for bit, lack of better words. So he's, his role is not um, so much part of the plot as it is explaining the plot. Yeah. All right, well, um, We'll see you next uh, next month, and sadly won't be here. But you know, hopefully soon enough, and hopefully when um, we'll have more people and every and everything will be much more healthy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys.